I said, sure. Awesome. So far, I like it here. Very nice. Mm, twin is almost like Idaho Falls. Yeah. Almost, just not near as big. Yep. All right, I'm ready when you're ready. All right. So let's go on number one. What do you think of Osher's process for identifying opportunities and building companies? Um, so for this one, I put John Osher, I believe, was a smart man. Uh, he looked for a need and built it upon it. For his experience, he was able to come up with a list of do's and don'ts on what he did for his company. Um, from the history, from his history, it sounds like he builds upon or builds a, up a cust company and finds a supplier that is interested and then sells the company and so far it works great for him. Well, I put, I think this process to follow the list of the 16 mistakes entrepreneurs do not have to make wrong expectations mistakes. Uh, he created this list not only to help others but to use it as his uh, process to find opportunities. Nice. Yeah, I, it, it sounds like he's really smart. He, he um, hires the best of the best. It sounds like he's more of a startup-driven kind of individual. <clears throat> like he's passionate about the whole startup and designing and innovating, but then it just, you know, after a while, he's obviously doesn't need any money or anything like that, so he's kind of want to move on to the next thing or something. Yeah. That's what I kind of got from it. Yeah. Um, so the second one, who is John Osher? Um, I put that he's an entrepreneur. He does. Um, he looks at where the need is, and supplies the cust uh, customer with a solution, and basically builds his company up. And All right, I put. Yeah. He is a smart man. I said Dr. Osher is an educated man that has a passion to find things that could help others. He seeks after the thrill of finding niches in different markets and then creates them. Yep. All right. So is spin brush a good idea? I said I think the spin brush was a good idea. There wasn't one already in the market at a reasonable cost. Um, I didn't write this, but I think – um, they were saying that there was either the manual toothbrush or the more expensive high-end power toothbrushes. Yeah, it was like the $50, the one that your dentist always tries to sell you. Uh-huh. Um, John was able to come up with the idea and the brush pattern to fill the need that was in the market. That's what I put. Um, I have, yes, the spin brush is very successful in the beginning, selling as many as 6000 a day, but he uh, took his idea for granted because quickly, um, I don't know why at first I kind of thought he was copying, but he's really not. He was actually creating a whole new niche. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but John was able to plan for that um, new product design. And, sorry, I didn't quite gather my thoughts on that one. There you go. jumped around on that one. And I kind of liked um, how they said that the spin brush, it's a mixture between manual and the electronic. It still has the bristles for the manual, but it also has the the revolving bristles for the, the electronic toothbrush. Yeah. Um, why haven't larger companies already done a spin brush? And I kind of went back to the, the, the two different markets. I said they believe that the market only had two segments, manual toothbrushes and high-end high power toothbrushes. Uh, John saw that there was a need for a cheaper power toothbrush in the industry. All right, and I just put large companies like to look for a perfect solution and spend a lot of time in developing. Like They try to look for smaller companies that already do the, the footing, the foundation rather than spending so much more money, you know, reinventing a new segment. Yeah. So John was able to get something put together in the market, which created the new niche. So I guess that's that's kind of how the other competitors kind of overlooked that individual because he didn't fall in either of those segments. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think you're right. When you said overlook, they just kind of overlook that there might be a need for it. Um, so this one, the next question, how much is a spin brush worth? So I think if I remember going through all the like PowerPoints, they said to figure out um, where there is a problem, like a mathematical problem. Um, so what I did was, how much is a spin brush worth? Well, they said that it was under $6 a unit. Um, so I decided if the, the company was selling 6,000 units per day, um, and then if you took that and times it by 365 days, it equal um, 2 million 190,000 units per year. And I said if the brush was sold at 599, that would put the cost of the company for the year at 13 million 140,000. That's just a yearly what they would make off of that. Not including the cost. I kind of had the same concept, only I put mine just the I kind of broke it down by kind of the per day. So I took the five to six times that by the six thousand per day, kind of give you the average revenue of. <clears throat> so, for the two different types of stores, one store it was like five under five dollars, the other one was under six. So I broke it down between the two, and I times yeah. that by the six thousand. So, on average, his revenue per day was between thirty and thirty-six thousand. Oh dang, that's cool to break it up for the day. I didn't think about that. And wasn't it, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, wasn't the under five dollars for like the bigger retails like Target and Walmart? Yep. Yeah. So I just try to kind of broke it down and kind of included it with fluctuation because I mean <clears throat> they didn't really tell us what his overhang or what his expenses were, so we couldn't actually, you know, figure out what his net gain was. It was just is gross okay otherwise I was going for the net but I looked over it twice and I didn't find him exactly what his expenses were yeah I looked at that too normally when I read a case study because I've read this case study before in another class but normally I just like don't even look at the graphs or anything so it was kind of kind of good to read through what what's expected and how to actually look through a case yeah I thought it was really useful to watch that um, I also kind of went over this case in a different class but I remember when I was looking at it I was still looking at like <clears throat> I was also taking um, accounting and so I was always looking at the balance sheet and spreadsheets and I was always trying to calculate what the you know net worth of the company was yeah. And so I was trying to, you know, break down rather than, well, what's the yearly? Well, that's looking too far ahead. And so I wanted to know what, you know, what could he lose tomorrow? Yeah, if he so, didn't have the company. Yeah. I mean, even if he licensed it from somebody, it's still taking a chunk out of his take home. So. Yeah. So it kind of sounds like for number six, I think we're on the same page. What should John do? He should license. You said he should license? Yeah, the reason I say he should license with the Crest brand is at first I was thinking he need to build it up, but when I was going over the case study, he seems really passionate about the start. But obviously nothing else kind of drives him to, well, he doesn't need money, and he always looks for the individuals that can run the operation afterwards. So if the Crest brand's looking and he wants to license it that way <clears throat> they can manage it and he can still make a pretty good profit off of it. Yeah. See, I, I said that he would just sell it to Crest. Mm. Okay. Well, I also kind of remember if this case is based off of uh, kind of live instances. I remember when I was a little bit younger that I remember getting one of those little Crest toothbrushes for like six dollars I thought that was the coolest thing in the world so yeah I mean 
and sell the business, he might cut out too short, but by licensing it with Crest, he still has income and he can feel free to go and do whatever else he wants to do. You know what I mean? Like be a silent partner is what my mentality was. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't think about it that way. Because that way he still wants to <clears throat> he still wants to generate income from it and he still wants to kind of have a little bit of say with the marketing stuff, but by strengthening his image with the brand, he might go from six thousand to twelve thousand per day, you know. And even yeah. if the Crest brands say, "Oh, well, we're going to take a percentage," it still might be higher than what he could do on his own. But if he was to sell it to Crest before the other competitors got in the market, couldn't he make more <laughs> that way? You know, I thought about that the first time of selling it. But the more I keep looking over and over the case study, it's what's taking the competitors so long to actually get in the market. You know, if yeah. first they overlooked it and Crest has been working on it for who knows how long from what I kind of looked over the case study, it sounded like they kind of developed the idea, hey, we need to open this up and somebody else already did. I think it, by the time the big companies actually produced a product that could keep, compete, it would well make its money's worth beyond just selling it. Yeah, I because, think I mean, how long do you think it normally takes to develop a product? I mean, once you come up with the plans and then you have to get it. Didn't you know, it whatever. say in the case study that it only took him like six months? To get it patented and everything? What? Or just the design? <laughs> Was it just the design? I think the design just took him six months, but as far as to develop a product, to get it licensed, and then to get it to an outlet store, well, first you got to get it manufactured in a large quantity and then get it to an outlet store. I've not known of any product that can do it under a year. Yeah. And I'm thinking he, <clears throat> he would still make his money well within, so. That, I, 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 I teetered and tottered on both, but I think ultimately that was what I kind of came up with is he should just license it, write it out. They can, you know, grow his brand and he can still get a lengthy check for, you know, like write it out. Yeah. Yeah, I think I agree with you. Because, I mean, he doesn't really care for the money. He's not hurting for the money. It's, yeah, let's just write it out and whatever comes my way, great. Otherwise, I'm going to focus and dedicate my time in this other niche. Yeah. Because if he was just to sell it, he'd be bored again, just like it said earlier in the case study. Mm, yeah. But this way, he could actually do something with it still. Yeah. He can always tweak it enough to make it even better because even if competitors come out with something, then he can, oh, well, that's kind of a good idea. Well, we can alter that idea and change this on my plans and... Because I think ultimately a lot of the competitors still try to base it on the same concept, but try to skew it enough to where, you know, the legal fees of trying to skew the patent doesn't interfere, you know? Yeah. And a patent's only good for 20 years anyway, so if you wrote it out for another 20 years, by the time his competitors caught up. Yeah, that's true. Because there's a few people that I know that sold out their business before, and they kind of wish that they just write it out. Yeah, that would be smart. So, um, so number seven, how do you analyze a case? So, I didn't know what he was really looking for. Well, um, I can, what was that? I was going to say, for me, I kind of follow the same guidelines of what I got from the videos. So, I just put, I read the first section, then I read the last section. After I got the overview, I developed some questions to help me understand the case. And then... You know, knowing what I'm looking for and how to resolve a situation. Um, that's how I kind of analyze and develop the case. I'm not sure if we should put something more to that. Or... It, that's what I put. I then was able to read the middle section and determine what I would do if I was John, is what I put. 
Okay. But I guess number eight, I guess I, I developed some questions, but I didn't actually write them down other than, you know, what the market value of Spin Brush Company was, because that's, I was all trained my mind towards the accounting side of me, wanting to know more about the actual numbers rather than, you know. Yeah. So on number eight, I didn't know if it was for the case or what you would ask an entrepreneur. So I put, how might one learn uh, what a successful market need and what would just be a, like a want and not be as successful? If that makes any sense. Mm, yeah, I was gonna say similar. I mean, the other one that kind of came to mind is what is the need for this new product in a new niche or a new segment? Yeah. Well, I think we got all the questions. I had a question when you learn to ask as an entrepreneur. Oh, yeah, I think like I said, he just thinking like what questions would you be asking yourself like, you know, as if you were in his shoes, what questions would you develop to make your decisions? Like whether or not to license L or... Yeah, so to develop that thought process. <clears throat> if you were to start your own business today, what are the questions that would go through your mind? You know, and I guess if you were in John's shoes, you'd say, all right, well, I have this awesome product. Yeah. I got a patent on it. Obviously, I'm making killer money just on the daily sales. What more can I do? Can I grow it? Do I see a better need? So, anyways, I appreciate for taking time out of your day. Yeah, um, I'll, get, I'll get this uh, this link posted. Okay. Um, he said to put like the time when we start talking about it, but I just put broadcast right when we were talking about it, so I'll just put like thirty seconds. And so he knows, like, when we start talking about it. Yeah, are we supposed to discuss it for a certain period of time, like an hour? Or does it matter how much discussion we've been doing? It did take about an hour, I think. So I don't know. Because we did it, I was going to say we did it in less than an hour. We did. But we're all on the same page, and we're all developing the same idea. Yeah. And I think as we go on, learn more, then we can stretch it out a little longer. Well, I'm pretty sure the cases that are to come, they're going to be a little bit more complicated, or they might have. I, I was looking through some of the weeks, and it looks like there's two case studies. So, I mean, if oh, we really? talk, yeah. So if we talk about 20, 30 minutes per case study, I can see that being closer to the hour. Okay. All right. So, um, does today work like um, Fridays work best for you then, or does it all just depend mm, if we have to do more? Kind of depends, because right now I'm switching over to. So during the process of developing sugar, um, we have that weird schedule. But then, right now, we're switching over to m &R, which is the repair and maintenance side. And so, okay. d it depends on each division. Right now, my division is going to start nine-hour work days, Monday through Friday. But um, I know as time goes on, it's going to switch to, to five or six twelves. <laughs> All right. So, so I mean... Right now, I'm going to say pretty solid between Thursday and Friday. So if you still want to, you know, have your Friday nights to go on date nights or whatever, okay. um, probably leaning more of let's try to meet on Thursdays. Okay, we can do that. And then I'll let you know if we need to make any other changes. I mean, other than that, from 6 to 6, I'm usually busy at work. But other than that, pretty open. Pretty free. Okay. Sounds good. I'll just reach out to you then. All right, you got my number. Thanks. Yep, thank you. See ya.